Thank you so much, Selina, for this introduction. So indeed, I'm going to talk about happiness. And we rarely stop to ask ourselves why we experience physical and mental pain, emotional pain. Uh, we often assume this is an inherent part of, part of life, but in fact, that is not true. It is a specific strategy of evolution by natural selection. And the best way to understand that process of evolution by natural selection is from the genetic perspective. Now, from that perspective, the genes are replicators. They make copies of themselves whenever the organism uh, comes to reproduction. Well, genes of that organism will be implanted in the next generation. And so from that genetic perspective, the organism itself, the individuals, people, animals, plants, the individuals themselves are actually a kind of vehicle that these replicators use to make as many replications of themselves as possible. So in a way, from an evolutionary perspective, it's not so much a chicken that lays eggs to get more similar chickens, but rather the egg, the genetic material that produces a chicken to get more eggs, to get more similar genetic material. And we have to ask ourselves, well, what makes a gene successful or what makes genes successful? And I think there's two important things here. The first one I think will be pretty well known. First of all, it is equipping their organism with uh, advantageous physical traits like camouflage and sharp teeth and, and fast muscle twitch fibers and so forth for predators and prey. All of, uh, all of that in the service of survival and reproduction. But equally important, at least when it comes to animal organisms, and so obviously also to humans, is the way that genetic programming is going to steer the organism in an environment full of threats and opportunities. And the way our genetic programming does that, or psychological programming, which uh, is uh, based on our genetics, is uh, with what I call sticks and carrots. Sticks are the painful sensations, physical pain, but also painful emotions. And once we've experienced that, we're going to do everything to avoid that in the future. Carrots are pleasure, rewarding emotions. And once we've experienced those, well, we'll try to get more of those in the future, right? And so we're in a way puppeteered with these sticks and carrots. And all of our emotional life is nothing but a specific strategy of that genetic programming. And this has important consequences. The first important realization is that threats generally outweigh opportunities from an evolutionary perspective. Missing a threat could mean the end of the life of the organism and therefore draw a definitive line through the replication ambitions of those genes. So they'll do anything to avoid that. Missing an opportunity is definitely a missed opportunity, but in the future there will be more opportunities. And because of that, our genetic programming well handles large sticks and small carrots. We experience physical and emotional pain as more intense generally, also more frequently and for longer periods of time than pleasure and rewarding emotions. And uh, we see this in a number of ways. I'm going to um, highlight two important ways in which this becomes clear. First of all, we're endowed with a so-called hyperactive threat detection mechanism. Our brain is constantly scanning the environment for things that might go wrong. And whenever something goes wrong, well, it brings out the sticks and uh, unleashes, you know, a stress reaction, a fight or flight reaction uh, to have us deal with that threat. Think about camping at night in a dark forest, you're alone in your tent and um, you hear some noises uh, out there in the distance. Now, the rational part of your brain knows, well, there are no deadly predators in these woods and um, probably also no murderous psychopaths. But you cannot suppress this stress reaction and before you know it, there's a bunch of alarming thoughts flooding your consciousness, like what is it, does it come in my direction and so forth. Or perhaps an example closer to our everyday life, you call a friend, he doesn't pick up. You call your friend again, doesn't pick up again. 
again, you try to say to yourself, well, she's probably busy or, uh, well, she may have, you know, forgotten her phone. But before you know it, again, your consciousness becomes flooded with this, this important stress reaction and thoughts come up like, what did I say? What did I do? Why is she mad? And so forth. Or perhaps in traffic, you know, this driver cuts you and, um, well, before you know it, there's this angry, angry reaction and perhaps a loud curse escaping your mouth. In all of these cases, well, your hyperactive threat detection mechanism was lighting up and um, was unleashing this fight or flight response. Now, in our current environment, uh, which is in contrast to the environment of our ancestors, not characterized by very frequent lethal threats, well, this is mostly something that weighs on our own happiness and well-being, not only our own happiness and well-being, but also of those around us who have to undergo our uh, stressful reactions. This asymmetry between threats and opportunities, these big sticks and these small carrots are also clear in a, a different way. Say you give a presentation at work. It goes well, you get a lot of compliments afterward, but there's one colleague who didn't like it. And he tells you in no uncertain terms that, well, your presentation was not up to standards. Now, two, three months later, when you think back on that presentation, what is probably the one remark that you remember? You guessed it, the negative one. Psychologists call that the negativity bias. Our brains are like Velcro, absorbing, attracting all of the negative and Teflon for all of the positive. It just rolls off of our brain all of the good things and the bad things, well, they nest in our brain. They make much, a much stronger psychological impact. We remember them much more, much better and, um, well, uh, they take up all of our attention. And so in the context where there's as many good as bad things happening, or perhaps even more good than bad things, well, our brain has the deplorable tendency to focus on the bad. Perhaps this will be something you have experienced before. So now time for a first question. Have you ever been in a situation in which one piece of criticism stuck with you despite receiving a lot of praise? I'm waiting for some answers from the chat. Yeah, I see some absolutely. And yes, I think it all sounds familiar, right? I know at least I have. So please be gentle in the chat here. But the thing is, we do not only need bad things to happen in our environment to feel bad. In fact, all we need is imagination. And human brains have wonderful capacities for imagining. Research shows that our brain or our mind is wandering for about 47% on average of our waking life. That means half of the time we're awake, half of our life is spent thinking about something that is not here and now, not in our immediate environment. Research also shows that whenever we think, uh, whenever our mind is wandering, that it has, you know, the problematic tendency to wonder about all the things that went bad in the past and might go wrong in the future. And we're incredibly creative when it comes to imagining possible threats in the future. Now, the evolutionary reason there is that this simulation machine that our brain is, this mind wandering, well, uh, well, the, the reason it exists and the reason our minds wander so much was to kind of have us learn from mistakes from the past and to uh, actually equip us for possible problems in the future. And so because of these large sticks and these relatively small carrots, well, we're uh, very often, much more often than we'd like in the grip of negative emotions, negative mental reactions. But the problem is not only with these sticks. The problem is actually also with these carrots. Now imagine you open the cupboard and you find your favorite chocolate there. You do not, you know, um, resist the temptation. You take a first bite and it's a heavenly experience. But before you swallow that first bite, your mind is already wandering to that problem at work. We know how that's gonna end. And you're no longer enjoying that chocolate, right? 
we get used to good things very, very quickly and their good effect doesn't last nearly as long as we often tend to think they will before they happen to us. Think also about the dreams we may have had as children. Right? I want to be an Olympic champion or I want to be a world-renowned artist or a CEO of a gigantic company, prime minister, president and so forth. And the unchecked assumption there is that if these unlikely dreams would come true, that we'd also be incredibly happy for the rest of our lives, right? Well, research shows that extremely successful people are not happier than average. In fact, they succumb more to depression and uh, addictions than the average person. But the same goes for our more modest dreams. This promotion at work, this new house and so forth. We tend to think that these things will make us lastingly happy. But in fact, whenever they, when they happen, we quickly get used to these improved circumstances and we're not so much happier than before. So again, I'm asking you, is this something that sounds familiar? There's a small poll that should appear now. Have you ever really wanted something and thought it would make you lastingly happy or very much happier for a long time, but once you got it, well, you notice that your happiness quickly returned to the same level as before. It was back to business as usual. All right, yeah, I see a lot of yeses happening and I think it's a, um, yeah, a, a typical, typical human psychological feature. We call it hedonic adaptation. If I can go back to my slides, uh, one back actually. Sorry, that's my mistake. But hedonic adaptation. Hedonic adaptation, uh, the fact that we adapt to improved circumstances in our life, well, it's problematic for a number of reasons. First of all, the promise that our psychological programming makes us is not one that is kept whenever these good things happen, right? We think, well, this is going to make me very happy. And then we find, well, whenever that happens, we get used to it pretty quickly and we're not happier than before. It also makes us vulnerable to loss. Think about our friend on the slide there with his fancy car. Well, um, predictably, after a few weeks, definitely after a few months, that positive effect of his car is gone. He's no happier than he was before driving in his old little car. But that doesn't mean you can now just take back that car and give him back his old car because it doesn't matter anyways. No, if you do that, that's going to sting a very long time. Even more problematic is that hedonic adaptation makes us chronically dissatisfied. It's a pattern here. We want something, we get it, we adapt to it, and we want a new thing, and a new thing, and a new thing. And we keep on craving, craving, and we also keep on postponing our happiness. We keep telling ourselves, well, uh, I'll be happy when, I'll be happy when, and so forth. And the rules of our genes is pretty clear here. What our genetic programming wants is to motivate us, but not to satiate us. It doesn't want us after we've taken a good carrot and uh, it doesn't want us to be, you know, blissfully happy ever after. No, it wants us to strive for this next carrot, especially when it comes to things like getting more status in the group and getting more possessions and so forth. It's never enough for psychological programming. Also, importantly, for this genetic strategy to work and for to keep their vehicle motivated to chase these new things, well, the vehicle, the organism itself, us, well, we must remain in the dark. And that's also something we see. People, although, and I've asked you the question, and it, when you ask people about it, it, we recognize the fact that we have this hedonic adaptation, but generally we keep thinking that, well, the next thing is going to make us happy. It's going to be different with that next thing. Right? So psychologists talk about an optimism bias. And this may sound like a good thing and maybe even contradictory to the negativity bias we've talked about, but in fact, it is not. Right? The optimism bias is the fact that uh, we tend to overestimate the happiness that a future good thing will bring us. So it's all about reality, not meeting our expectations. And so we keep on, you know, as I said, chronically dissatisfied, postponing our happiness. I will be happy when I need this for my happiness. I need this and so forth. So with this in mind, I'd like to take you 
on a little thought experiment. Imagine we could travel back in time and we travel some 150,000 years ago and we'd find there modern, biologically modern human beings. But obviously they live in very, very different circumstances. They're hunter-gatherers and they live in an environment that is characterized by scarcity. Often they go to bed hungry. They're constantly threatened by infectious diseases for which they do not have a cure accidents, but also mostly, you know, the animosity, uh, the hostility of other humans, other groups. Uh, estimates are that the chances of being murdered by another human beings were more than 500 times larger in prehistoric times than here today, globally, even more so when you just consider Western Europe, for instance. The average life expectancy was 26 years old and that had a lot to do with an astronomically high uh, child mortality. One out of four children would die in the first year, half of the children would be dead by the 16th birthday. Right, so imagine you would talk to one of those distant ancestors and you would ask him or her like, what does your dream life look like? Your purely utopia, your the best possible life. They might answer something like, well, a world in which there's always enough food, in which we never have to go hungry, a world in which we don't have to fear for our lives because of enemies, a world in which we won't have to bury our children. Now, this utopia would seem like a completely unrealistic situation to them, so very different from their day-to-day -day life. Now, it should be clear that and I hope for all of you, but for the most of us, that these ideal circumstances actually came to fruition. Even more so, we possess all sorts of technological innovations that these distant ancestors could never have predicted. We have you know, robust housing protecting us against you know, harsh weather conditions. We've got electricity you know, doing all kinds of very, very hard tasks uh, that uh, we no longer have to do. We have airplanes taking us in a matter of hours to a different continent. I mean, the utopia has not only been realized of our distant ancestors, it's been surpassed. But what they would never have imagined is that they're very pampered, um, uh, the very pampered people who are living now, that they wouldn't be blissfully happy in their worry-free lives. What they would not have expected, most probably, is that hedonic adaptation got us adapted to these improved circumstances gradually, and that in the absence of really you know, acute life-threatening problems or hyperactive threat detection mechanism, is just zooming in more and more and more and um, creating first world problem of gigantic proportions. Does that mean that all of these improvements, external improvements in life conditions have not yielded any fruit? No, we know that it does, it does elevate happiness somewhat, but much less than you would expect or hope. The simple constatation is that we're not programmed for durable happiness. We're captivated by what went wrong, what goes wrong, and what could go wrong in the future. We quickly get used to improved circumstances and we're never satisfied. And if my story would end here, that would be a very depressing story. But fear not, there is a remedy and the story I'm bringing is very much a hopeful one. Even more so, that remedy has been known for a very long time in very different cultural contexts. From the Buddhists in the East to the Stoics in the West, they all stumbled upon the same kind of insights and practices that can durably improve our happiness. And more importantly, these insights and practices are now being validated by modern scientific research on happiness. Now, the point of departure of all of these traditions and what emerges very clearly from the research on happiness is that in order to improve your happiness in a durable and lasting way, you should not merely concern yourself with your circumstances, but in the first place, work on yourself. What we see from the research is that we tend to kind of float around a pretty stable point of happiness, a happiness set point. And when things go well, well, we float above it. When things go poorly, well, we dip under it, but we keep returning to that point. So how do we raise that happiness set point? Well, very simply, 
by dispelling the ruse of our genes and stopping to react so strongly to the sticks and the false carrots that our genetic programming unleashes on us. How does that work? How do we stop reacting to sticks? That is what developing equanimity entails. Let me give you an example. Uh, let's say you're driving towards a very important appointment and you're well within time, you're going to arrive 10 minutes beforehand, but then you hear a loud noise. Oh, flat tire. You stand there on the side of the road and what's probably happening, happening is a very you know, strong stress reaction that brings forth all sorts of very alarming thoughts like why does this happen, have to happen today? Why does this have to happen to me? And so forth. Right? With these thoughts, you're going to strengthen and also uh, increase that, uh, that stress reaction in time. And so you're going to stay in the grips of that stress reaction that's going to bring on more of these negative thoughts. And that way you can, you know, psychologically suffer for hours. Research in neuroscience has shown that when we do not feed negative stress reactions in this way, it shouldn't last longer than 90 seconds. That is the time your body needs to absorb all of the cortisol, the adrenaline, your stress hormones, and return to a state of relative rest. Now, quite often, I think, we experience that negative emotions last longer than 90 seconds. And that is because we're caught in this negative feedback loop between negative thoughts and this stress reaction and so forth. So how do we get out of that? How do we free ourselves from these negative mental reactions? How do we develop equanimity in the face of setbacks? Well, and this is one of the key contributions of Buddhism um, and also of what today uh, goes by the name of mindfulness. Well, we shouldn't feed those negative emotions. And the way not to feed these negative emotions is by not identifying with the thoughts and the feelings that come up. Let me go back to the example. So when all of these things happened, you were there with your flat tire, well, probably, unless you've already been training in this, and then I do congratulate you, but probably you weren't thinking like, hmm, interesting, there's all sorts of, you know, physical sensations coming up, like heat, vibrations, and there's thoughts coming up like, why does this have to happen today, and so forth. No, you were completely taken over by the negative reaction, you were identified with these thoughts and emotions. That's also what we see in our language, you say, I am mad, I am scared, and so forth. Well, in fact, that is not the right way to look at it. All of these sensations and thoughts, well, they're nothing but very fleeting, fleeting appearances in consciousness. So you should say, I feel anger, I feel fear, and so forth. Right? And this is precisely how we can free ourselves from these negative mental reactions. It's easier said than done, but practice really can help us there. What we need to do is to uh, have a different kind of relationship to these thoughts and feelings, to not identify by them. We just observe them, we see them come up, and as I said, very quickly, you know, dissipate and make place for new contents of consciousness. And also for the Stoics, developing equanimity was, you know, the key task we had in our lives in order for us to be happy and to be free of these lengthy negative mental reactions. And the whole of Stoic philosophy, you can kind of uh, summarize in one sentence. That is, make the difference between what you do and what you do not control and only accord importance to the first. So what you do control. What do you control according to the Stoics? Well, very simply, the way you react to things happening. What you say, what you do. What don't you control? All of the rest. You know, things going well or setbacks. Um, riches, reputation, all of these things. And the Stoics say, well, spontaneously we have the tendency to obsess about all of these things. At night we lay awake like, oh, I hope this doesn't happen. Oh, I hope this will happen and so forth precisely about what we cannot control. What we should think about at night or during the day, whenever, what we should think about is, hmm, if this would happen, I hope I would react this way. And how can I train myself to react in this, you know, better way to problems that may arise? And now that we've dealt with these reverberating sticks, we can also tackle these false carrots. And the best way to do that is by developing contentment. We should expose these false carrots for what they are. We should know that, well, 
they look so alluring, they're not going to be feeding us for a very long time. Their effect will dissipate in the shortest time and we'll be chasing a new carrot. And if we're not careful, we're going to condemn ourselves to be chronically dissatisfied chasing carrot after carrot after carrot. And this never ends how many of these carrots you manage to catch. Does that mean you can't have any ambition? Of course not. It only means that you, you should not, or I mean, the advice would be not to think that you will only be happy or only be happier when you reach these things, when you get this new carrot. Because research clearly shows that that is not the case. And if we keep telling ourselves this, well, we're condemning ourselves to be chronically dissatisfied with life as it is right now. And a very good way to develop that contentment is by having a gratitude practice. Now, it was a key element in both Buddhist, Stoic and other traditions. Uh, it's also something that is being studied now and uh, the effects are uh, pretty amazing when done well. When you take a lot of creativity in it and you train your brain to kind of uh, identify these things and dwell upon these things that are good in your life and for which you are truly grateful, you can really train your brain not only to see whatever went wrong what goes wrong and what could go wrong in your environment, which we spontaneously have a tendency to do uh, to a large extent, but you can train your brain to also notice all of these good things in your life. And, uh, and this is such an important one because otherwise, well, uh, however good our lives will be objectively, well, we still may have the feeling that uh, it's lacking something. And the Stoics, they had a very powerful uh, strategy for this. Um, they did what we call negative visualization. So what they would do is they would bring to mind all bad things or a number of bad things, soft, sometimes, you know, catastrophic things that did not happen to them. Hopefully your children are not hungry. Hopefully you're not on your deathbed. Hopefully you're not about to lose somebody you really love. And know that if this would be the case, that you would have almost every, that you would give almost everything to be in exactly your situation right now. How incredibly grateful are you then not? How incredibly content are you not with your life precisely as it is? And so once we've dealt with these false carrots and we've developed this discontentment, well, we can actually uh, go and chase the one true durable carrot, the one nutritious carrot and our ticket to durable happiness. And that is very much connection with other people around us. Now, the longest running study on happiness started in 1938 in Harvard, and they followed a group of seven, eight hundred people, children back then, uh, for their whole life. And um, some, I mean, pretty recently, eight years after date, so in 2018, that study came to a close. And the results that came out of that are remarkable. The best predictor of how happy the lives were of the participants, but not only how happy their lives were, but even how healthy and how long these people lived, was the quality of their social interactions. Not how many friends they have, but how deep and how tight the close social uh, relationships were. We're a social species. And for humans to be durably happy, we need other people around us and we need to have close ties to other people. Not only close ties to other people, but also helping other people seems to be a wonderful thing we can do for our happiness. There's more and more studies coming out about altruism and happiness. And the picture that, the, that is emerging is that people who are altruistic, who like to help other people, give some of their time and perhaps their resources to help other people, well, that they are more and uh, that they are much happier than average. And in fact, there was a recent study in which that effect was shown to be really quick. Uh, there was a group of students, they divided them in two, they all give them like $50. And they said to one part of the group, now spend this today on yourself. To the other part of the group, they said, spend it today on somebody else. You can choose who it can even be, you know, uh, um, to welfare anyways. You, you're completely free to give it to somebody else, but benefit somebody else with that money. Guess who was happier at the end of uh, that day? Well, the ones who had to give it to somebody else. And that effect was noticeable in the following weeks. And that's perhaps the most hopeful thing that comes out of the study in happiness. The more you help others to happiness, the more it also befalls on you. 
And so we come to the timeless recipe for happiness, the recipe that was known in these different cultural traditions and that is more and more emerging from the scientific research on happiness now. Be equanimous, don't feed negative emotions and accept what you cannot change. Be content, train your attention towards all of the good things in your life and don't keep craving for more and more and more. Be loving and kind, live closely together to other people and give some of your time and efforts to the happiness of other people. But all of that is easier said than done. We risk without against our better judgment to kind of succumb to these sticks and these carrots again to fall back into mental automatisms. And so we must very much train our brain to be happier. As Mathieu Ricard, the Buddhist monk you see there, but also a person with a scientific background and who's collaborated with scientists on, on the research on, on happiness in general and meditation in particular, says happiness is very much a skill. It's not something that happened or doesn't happens to us or doesn't happen to us. It's something we need to train and you can train it with meditation and other practices. So what is meditation and what does it do for us? Well, grossly speaking, we can say that there's three kinds of meditations. First of all, you have, and these are the best known, the concentration meditations in which you're going to bring your attention, attention to a certain point, like the breath, or um, sounds, or body sensations, or a mantra, something you keep saying in your head. And whenever your mind is wandering, which will happen a lot, you just, in all rest and easiness, you bring it back to that point of attention. Then we have open awareness meditations, in which you're not going to focus on a specific point, but you're just going to leave your consciousness wide open and notice everything that comes up, and without kind of pursuing these things. You're not pursuing the thoughts, the sensations, the feelings, the sensory impressions. You're just noticing and letting it go. And then uh, the final one uh, or the final kind of meditations are cultivation meditations in which you're going to cultivate certain uh, state of minds uh, that are uh, beneficial for your happiness and the people around you, like contentment, like equanimity, like loving kindness. And so what does that do for you? Well, first of all, meditation teaches your attention not to wander that much. You're going to have more attention for what's happening here and now. And we know what a wandering mind does to us and to our happiness. So that's a great win. But then even more importantly, especially with these open awareness meditations, well, you're going to gain more insight into the workings of your own mind. What thoughts regularly come up? What kind of emotions? How are these linked? And you're going to start seeing these mental patterns and you're going to be able to free yourselves quicker from them by noticing them quicker. But even more importantly, you're going to develop that new relationship to these thoughts and emotions. You're going to see them for what they are, temporary fleeting appearances in consciousness that, you know, ebb out and make place for other contents of consciousness in the shortest of times. And then finally, with these cultivation meditations, of course, you're going to cultivate these state of minds that are so conducive to your happiness, and you're going to train your brain to produce more of these states in daily life. So meditation is a very powerful means to reprogram our brain for happiness, but we cannot leave it at that. Research also shows that having a meditation practice definitely helps uh, in most cases, but uh, quite often the effects are somewhat limited. What we need to do is to extend that happiness training to our daily life. It's in our daily life, in the hustle, bustle and the chaos of that daily life that we need to develop that equanimity. It's also in our daily life that we can actually train our mind to focus all of the good things in our environment. And it's of course in our daily life that we can form close connections to other people and uh, also help other people, which as I said, can make us so much happier. And with all of this, we can uh, radically transform the experience of our life. We can create a sort of happiness that doesn't depend on the whims of things going our way or things not going our way. And this brings me to uh, a final kind of consideration I'd like to share with you. And that is uh, the one of what we typically call enlightenment in, in these traditions. Now, quite for a very long time, people in the West, including myself, thought, well, this is some supernatural state from religions that have, uh, well, emerged in the East. 
but it's more and more clear that there's a perfectly secular understanding of what this is all about. It's about developing that new relationship with these thoughts and feelings and therefore freeing ourselves from these negative lengthy mental reactions and being able to um, enjoy more of all of the good things that life has to bring. And it's not a binary state. It's not that you're either enlightened or not at all. It's obvious that, you know, equanimity, contentment, loving kindness and so forth are qualities that you gradually develop. And so all of this does indeed take time and a certain dedication. But can you imagine a better use of your time and energy? Know that it's not only about your own happiness, but if you're going to work on your happiness, you're going to spread that to other people. I want to end with just one, uh, I think, important consideration, and that is that what emerges very clearly from the research is that uh, unless you're suffering from a depression now and you will be cured from this, that unless this is the case, well, you cannot expect to be much happier in the future than you are now. This is your happiness set point uh, for better or for worse. But do also know that you have the means to radically enhance the quality of the experience of your life. The research is also very clear on that. And I hope and I wish it to you, all of you. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Michael. So much uh, food for thought, and you brought it with a lot of energy and uh, hope. Mm, thank you. Uh, so looking forward uh, myself also to starting to bring some of these uh, into my daily life. We have a lot of questions from, uh, from uh, the listeners uh, online, so I'm going to dive uh, straight in there. First of all, from Ab, um, on this specific masterclass topic, you, of course, wrote a book in Dutch. Yeah, uh, and I'm assuming uh, this question is about the English language. Is that is uh, what is your favourite book that you would recommend to us all uh, to read on this topic, and uh, why? Um, let me first say the book is in Dutch, but there's a, a whole podcast series. I think we're going to link to them in this masterclass. Oh, um, great. So I've, I've got five six hours of recording conversations about okay. all of this like delving into the details of the book so if you're interested i would very happily guide you there and then you'll find more uh, more information there uh but otherwise um uh, it's it's very hard to pick one book right it, it's not uh, th there's a bunch of books that that really shape mm -hmm. my thinking about it um there's one uh, from Robert writes, Why Buddhism is True, which is a very interesting view and then that really shows how many of these insights developed in the Buddhist tradition actually now uh, are being scientifically validated and to what extent. So kind of this age-old okay. age wisdom tradition meeting the scientific research. Uh, there's uh, an interesting book by Pigliucci on, on Stoicism, uh, which really makes it applicable to, to daily life uh, and so forth. And so, yeah, many books, uh, those two come to mind now, but there's okay. this... Uh, yeah. Yeah. There's a whole wealth of literature out there. Yeah, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm sure. Thank you. Pleasure. And I uh, look forward to listening uh, to more of uh, what you have to say on, your, uh, on the podcast. Um, secondly, from Lara, she is wondering, how can we avoid or perhaps work on ourselves, right, with the, the, this hedon, hedonistic adaptation mm -hmm. uh, in this capitalist society that we live in where more is always better and we have all this advertising in our face the whole time to buy more and then... You know, you'll be happy in that new house. Um, how can we avoid or, or work on ourselves for that? Yeah, that, that's a very good point. Uh, indeed, you know, our modern context, uh, again, capitalistic society bringing products and actually yeah. creating wants for us, like, like quite often, yeah. it's not only, you know, playing to our desires, but actually how can we create a new want? Like, mm -hmm. like if it's more of that that we would need for happiness. Um, well, I think it makes it extra challenging indeed. And uh, uh, but but uh, so again, what, what is very important there is 
that you start to realize that this next character is not going to deliver, to deliver on happiness, which doesn't mean you cannot chase it, but stop, you know, holding your happiness ransom. Okay. Like saying, however mm -hmm. things turn out, well, this is not what makes me happy or does not make me happy. It gives direction to my life. So I'm going to do this. I have this and that ambition. That's all perfectly fine. But, you know, that subtle unchecked assumption mm -hmm. that like I need this for my happiness Try to detect that. And if okay. you have that, realize that that is not the case. This thing will, whatever it is, will not make uh, the prom will not yield on the promise unless it's connecting with other people, as I said, and, and <laughs> these type of things. Yeah. But it will not yield the promised happiness. Uh, and so by just knowing this, you can also free yourself from it, I think, for to a large extent. And then again, you know, training that contentment, mm. like what are the good things right now? Mm -hmm. What are you grateful for right now? And in the beginning, this may sound uh, or this, this may feel a little bit forced and dis disingenuous, perhaps, but know that that's actually a good sign, right? So you're training your brain in something that's in unfamiliar for your brain. Mm -hmm. And the more you do it, and if you bring some creativity and you put some depth in that practice, not just, okay, the three things I need to do today, tak, 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 and done. No, uh, give it some time. Well, you'll see that uh, at, after some time, well, your brain is going to start producing these grateful states more often and uh, you'll be very happy to, to notice that. Okay, so it won't then be hard to think of three. We'll then be able to come yeah. up with six uh, just, exactly. Uh, just exactly. like that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting indeed what you say to actually ask yourself the question, am I doing this because I think the expectation is that it'll make me happier? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we're kind of fooling ourselves a lot of the time, I guess. Yeah, we are. <laughs> um, a third question is from Ivana about the role of childhood. Mm -hmm. um, she says that from my understanding, a lot of our reactions and emotions in life stem from our childhood mm -hmm. experiences. So isn't it important to focus on healing these wounds mm -hmm. uh, as well in, in order to mm -hmm. develop enduring happiness, contentment? Yes, definitely. So indeed, childhood is a very important period. And that also becomes very clear from from research. So the triggers and, and the things that mm -hmm. kind of lead to the stress reaction to fear to frustration, anger, maybe the, those triggers, well, uh, they're different from everybody. And that has a lot to do with the environment in which we grew up and our family situation and so forth. So uh, everybody will have different issues there. And so, yes, uh, definitely it can help to, to kind of heal that and to make that conscious and, 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 and go in that healing process. But I, I, what I would say is the real healing process is just accepting these triggers and these emotions coming up and then just letting them dissipate on their own. And that's the radical practice of just having it come up and dissipate. And once you do that, you actually will train your brain not to have that same reaction to the trigger. So uh, maybe I can give like a small example of, of my own life. Uh, so I have uh, three wonderful daughters, but they have uh, the tendency to fight, you know, in the car. And it's always <laughs> this and that. And then I'm driving, I'm trying familiar. to concentrate and I'm getting all stressed up. And so uh, that, was a, that was becoming a real trigger for me, right? And, and so I, I would already be nervous when we stepped in the car and this wasn't conducive to their happiness or mine. <laughs> Anyways... Oh, right. So then by knowing this practice, I started focusing like, okay, let them fight for a while and then just, you know, feel all of these stressy emotions coming up and let it dissipate. And it's amazing how quickly, you know, that trigger stopped being a trigger for me. Now I'm, I'm, I will still say, okay, stop fighting girls, but I won't be as, you know, stressed about it and uh, as anxious about the whole thing. And this is obviously a light example, but I think the same principle applies to whatever triggers you and mm. whatever emotions come up. Uh, of course, that being said, if there's real trauma involved and so forth, it can be too painful and then you may not have the mental resources to, to do that and to accept it and to let it fade out. And, and so uh, you definitely uh, could use, you know, support in that uh, and so forth. But so uh, that is the transformative practice of uh, having it come up mm. and then having it dissipate and see like, OK, they're only emotions. And if in a way there uh, there's a massive bluff there. Right. So what is emotional pain? Now, physical pain can be incredibly intense and, and these practices mm -hmm. can help with that as well with chronic pain and so forth. But emotional pain, again, it's heat, tension, vibration. And it's amazing. It has such an incredibly, incredibly powerful control over us when, in fact, you know, the physical sensations themselves, if given the proper attention, are not inherently punishing. The whole point will be to remain or to stay out of your thinking mind, which is going to produce more and more of these alarming thoughts and keep you in that stress reaction and bring all the focus to these sensations and allow them to dissipate. And, and this can be incredibly freeing. Yeah. 
Yeah, sounds uh, almost enlightened. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's great. Sounds familiar as well in a car uh, with uh, arguing uh, children. Um, fourthly, from Annabelle, um, is do you believe that we should therefore stop chasing happiness? We read it everywhere, and I, I think society also makes us think that we should be happy. Do you think that we should stop chasing this happiness and, and try to learn how, how to feel satisfied with the status quo itself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's a very good point. If we chase happiness directly, um, it's actually very counterproductive. We're mm. kind of practicing dissatisfaction. Life is not good now. I need this. I need something else. I need to feel good. Also, we shouldn't just equate happiness with joy, for instance. Feeling often and, and wonderfully joyful mm. is definitely a very important part of a happy life. Mm -hmm. But it's not only about that emotion. I think if we could, you know, live our life in this one emotional register, like only in, in a joyful state of mind, we wouldn't actually want that. And uh, we, we'd miss, you know, the variety of emotions that exist. You know, uh, around many painful and, and, and sad emotions, there, there's still uh, uh, some beauty and, and, and something of value there. Think about mourning for a loved one and so forth. So just remaining in that joyful state is, is never what, what this is about. So that is one. But then also chasing happiness directly is counterproductive. There's a saying as well uh, in, in Buddhism, like if you uh, chase enlightenment, you're running the other way. I mean, because <laughs> you're practicing dissatisfaction. So what should you practice? Well, you should practice or you, you could practice equanimity, contentment, loving kindness, work on these things, and then happiness will follow. But don't chase it directly. I think that's a, that's a very good point. Yeah. And I think there's also something in the words we use as a society now. Happiness is this sort of elusive uh, term, whereas indeed there are all these other emotions and, and joy and all these other emotions that we can feel as well, sadness, and it's how we, uh, we deal with that in life. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Interesting how uh, the words we use have such a mm -hmm. big influence. Um, yeah, you just touched upon it uh, around um, with other forms, uh, but I'd be interested to, to hear your view on this from Brian. Um, what about the longing for happiness while having, for example, a chronic medical condition? So how do you overcome challenges that, that you know in, in that way can't be overcome with a, med with a chronic medical uh, condition. And, and, and there is a strong optimism bias, but how do you deal with such a situation? Yeah, and, uh, and that's a very good point. And, and um, I definitely empathize. Uh, it's hard for me to speak from that place because uh, I am not familiar uh, with such circumstances. Uh, but I think, and, and this is something where mindfulness practice and other happiness practices can really bring something. I think accepting what we cannot change is such a key thing. And I realize how incredibly challenging that may be in certain mm -hmm. circumstances. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's, of course, much easier said than done. But accepting what you have no control over is, is the key to happiness. And, um, and, and so mm -hmm. trying to work on the fact that... Uh, well, uh, life is what it is and uh, try to notice all of the good things in life and, and, and maybe some of these that negative visualization because we're always very much aware of what goes wrong now. Mm -hmm. uh, but when that thing didn't go wrong, like a week ago, for instance, we didn't think, ah, oh, how lucky we are that that thing is not happening, yeah. right? So it only hits us when it hits us, right? And so... Uh, Think about all of these things that didn't hit you. And I think that that goes for everyone. That's going to be such a profound practice, like uh, all of the things that didn't affect your life in a negative way and be incredibly grateful for that and find the beauty of life in, in that. And uh, I think uh, easier said than done again, but uh, we can really train our brain to, to, to notice all of the good things in life. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and also kind of contextualize the bad things and then say like, okay, this is what it is. I cannot change it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to mm -hmm. be at peace with it. But again, it takes training and, and, and perhaps uh, it takes support from other people and, and so forth to, to get you to that place. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, understood. Thank you. <laughs> uh, the last question from uh, Camille 
uh, is how how do, does one discuss happiness at work um, in such a critical context? So, for example, uh, with the wars going on at the moment, the news is all over it, uh, uh, you know, currently as well, without... So how does one talk about that without um, seeming naive or um, belittling, uh, you know, what, what else is going on in the world? Because it is an important aspect uh, to our lives. How does one balance that? Yes, or, or maybe without sounding selfish that you're concerned with your own yeah. personal happiness yeah. and then people yeah. are suffering uh, in, in Gaza and other places. Um, yeah, I think that that's a, that's a good point. Now, first of all, I would say that Working on your own happiness is something you not only do for yourself, but also mm -hmm. for other people, at least mm -hmm. the people in your close environment. If you're more in a peaceful state of mind, less of these stressful reactions, you're going to benefit their lives. Your contentment is going to spill over to them. And then obviously your loving kindness and so forth. Well, uh, they're also the beneficiary of that, of course. And so uh, we shouldn't see uh, working on ourselves and working on our happiness as, as something that is selfish. I would say it's, it's exactly the opposite. Uh, happier people are also more altruistic. We said altruistic people mm -hmm. are more happy. Obviously, the arrow goes in both directions. So when you're not feeling, I mean, when you're not in a, a positive state of mind, uh, it's much harder to consider uh, the problems of others. Uh, and so people close by or people far off. Mm -hmm. So work on yourself first and then you can actually help other people from a, a much better state of mind and in a much more efficient probably way. Yeah. 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 Um, super interesting. Thank you so much. I have uh, a million other questions <laughs> <laughs> I'd love uh, to uh, to ask you. But sadly, we're at the end um, of our uh, of our time uh, together. Thank you to everybody uh, for joining us with this masterclass and listening uh, to uh, Michael. Thank you. Uh, at Open Up, we uh, also organize interactive uh, group sessions uh, with a smaller amount uh, of people with quite a lot of interactions. For example, we have one about discovering your values, which I highly recommend. It's uh, super interesting. As I said before, we organize masterclasses once a month. The next masterclass is on Tuesday, the 29th of October, and it's about embracing constructive conflict, about how we can get comfortable uh, with disagreement. So really look forward uh, to seeing you all there. And for now, have a very good day. Goodbye.